Eric, thank you for joining uh, CP. I'm very excited about your new project. You are working on a film based on your book, Letter to the American Church. Can you tell me what prompted you to do that with Turning Point USA? Um, well, to be perfectly honest, uh, it wasn't my idea. I, I was, uh, the, le the book Letter to the American Church, I can, I can even say in a way th that I have never, you know, said with a book, it's my 14th book, but Letter to the American Church, the book wasn't really my idea. This was one of those strange things that only if you're a person of faith might it make sense to you, but I, I felt God calling me to write this book. I won't get into the details, but it was something I've never felt before uh, to speak to the church, kind of a burning prophetic. I've got to tell anyone who will listen, who's a Christian, um, that uh, you know the fundamental message of the book, Letter to the American Church, is the idea that we've got some theology wrong. We've drifted as the church, the evangelical church in America, and we forgot that faith without works is dead, that we've got to bring our faith into action. Bonhoeffer talked about that, uh, basically making the parallels between Bonhoeffer, uh, what he was trying to say to the German church in the 30s, and say how that's exactly what's happening today, that what he was saying to the German church of the 30s, and they didn't listen to it, is precisely God's message to the American church today to stand against the evil. So all of that really was God's idea. And I wrote the book. Uh, and then the movie, uh, I was speaking at Rob McCoy's church. Uh, I will be there um, actually tonight. I'm in Los Angeles. But I was speaking on this message uh, in, in the sermon. Um, and two women who are, you know, Hollywood veterans, so to speak, um, said, we've got to make a documentary film about this, this book, this message that you're delivering, Eric, we want to make a documentary film. And I thought, huh, that's certainly not something that ever occurred to me ever. So um, they were the ones behind it. Uh, they wrote the script, obviously using the message of my book, but it's an amazing thing to me that it wasn't my idea. Now the film exists. It's gorgeous. I have to say, I'm just tickled to death that it's so well made. It's a beautiful film. It's a documentary film. The message is there, but it's delivered in such a way that I'm I'm really proud to be a part of it, I have to say. Now, you wrote in the book that you're concerned about the complacency that you see in the American church. What are some ways in which you think the church has become complacent? Yeah, I mean, that's putting it mildly that I'm concerned. I think it's a fundamental misunderstanding of what the scripture says. The scripture demands that we put our faith into action. And I think that uh, in the evangelical church, many people have drifted into thinking that uh, it's mostly what I believe theologically. I'm saved by what I believe theologically. No, you're not. You're saved by faith, but faith has to be lived out. And, and so in a sense, we've kind of uh, filtered out the, the action part and we've acted as though, well, I'm, I'm saved by what I believe. I believe Jesus rose from the dead. I believe this, I believe that. But the point is, if you believe those things, if you actually do believe those things, you will behave differently. It, it, it's impossible not to behave differently. Um, and I really feel that right now, uh, the rise of evil uh, in American culture, in, in, in the whole world, but specifically in America, is something that Christians have an obligation from God, before God, uh, a, a commandment from God to stand against evil not simply to say, well, we're just going to do church. We're going to avoid those hot button issues. The church is called to speak against those hot button issues or against the, the evils that are rising. And I really feel that so many have bought this lie that um, somehow we can just do this religious thing. We don't have to get involved in politics or culture. We don't have to stand against evil. I don't want to be divisive. That we're supposed to separate out our faith um, from, you know, the rest of the world. And I think that that is what allows evil to rise. It is what has allowed evil to rise in our time, precisely as it allowed evil to rise under the Nazis. And a lot of times when you bring up the Nazis, people immediately think of the death camps and the Holocaust, and they think, oh, we're nowhere near that. Well, can I tell you, the Germans were nowhere near that when this began. And that's why they did nothing. They couldn't imagine what happens when an evil worldview takes over and the secular humanist atheist globalist marxist worldview that is 
flooding uh, our culture, our world right now, and has infiltrated the churches, that is precisely as evil as the worldview that the Nazis had. It's just different. But when churches don't speak against it, when Christians don't understand, it is your duty to speak against it, to vote against it, to act against it in every way imaginable. God will hold us accountable for not doing something in the same way that he held the German Christians accountable for taking a pass, essentially, um, on what was the evil that was rising in their day. When do you think the church started to retreat from the culture wars? Well, I honestly think that it's it's one of those things that doesn't really have an answer. I mean, you can look back. Uh, there have always been periods of pietism, people who, who wanted to retreat. Um, and, you know, some of that has its place. I mean, if you're going to retreat to a monastery to pray, there's a place for that. But I think that ultimately, um, if you look, look at Bonhoeffer, I mean, anybody who's read my book uh, about Bonhoeffer can see that many good Christians got it wrong. In other words, many good Christians had sort of bought into this idea that, oh, it's about grace. Luther said it's about grace. We know it's about not about works. Well, that's not quite true, right? You're saved by faith, yes, but your faith is born out in works. And it's very easy for people to over-focus on grace to the point that they twist it, and it becomes what Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. It's not real grace anymore. It's just this fake idea of grace. Uh, and I think the same thing has happened in the American church, where a lot of people basically said, you know what, uh, we've got a pretty good, we can avoid politics, we're just going to focus on evangelism, uh, we're going to we're going to avoid the hot button issues. The church is wrong ever to take that path. I mean, when slavery was the issue in America in the 19th century, it was Bible believing Christians that had the guts to say, we will take a stand against slavery, we will take a stand to abolish slavery. Before that, William Wilberforce led the campaign to end the slave trade because of his Christian faith. So your Christian faith is supposed to drive you to action, often political action, because po politically uh, is sometimes the way, it's, it's, what, it's the way that God has given us in a free culture to influence things. And so the secular left, the cultural Marxists, uh, the, the trans activists, you name it, they are using politics to push forward agendas that are unbiblical. And because they're unbiblical, they're going to harm people. They can they talk a good game. They're, they say they're against racism or they care about it. There is no way that an unbiblical worldview is going to help people in the end. It's gonna harm people. So it's gonna to pretend to help people, but it's gonna harm people. So it's up to believers uh, to speak up for what is right and good and true and to bring our faith into the public square, not to be afraid of politics, to get involved in politics, because this is one of the ways God has given us to effect change. And I think a lot of people, they're more worried about being liked. They think that being a Christian means I, I, don't, I don't argue with people. I'm winsome all the time. And sometimes you have to battle. We hear the term Christian nationalism being thrown around a lot. Do you think a lot of Christians are afraid of weighing in on those issues because of that label? But that's exactly the point. That's why the devil concocted this label, Christian nationalism. You, you, you come up with a label and it immediately shuts people up. And I think what would the devil want would be for Christians to be silent because that means God is silent. The voice of God is, is, is only alive through his church. He sent his Holy Spirit down and deputized his church to be his voice in history. And when you have people come up with a term like Christian nationalist, and, and then Christians who are so thin-skinned or, or so really uh, shallow in their faith that that's all it takes to silence them. And I want to say to Christians, hey, Christians, you've got to choose what do you really believe. If you really believe what the Bible says, you're not going to let a label silence you because it's not even an argument. I mean, what is Christian nationalism? It is, it is a made-up term. It's utterly preposterous. I don't know any Christian nationalists. It's just a term designed to shut people down and to say, mind your own business, keep your faith out of public life. Meanwhile, uh, a, a culturally Marxist, atheistic worldview, an inhuman, cruel worldview is being brought in. If the church does not rise against it to bring God's eyes into the cultural sphere, then evil wins. And evil does win when the church steps back, it happened in Germany. It's why I wrote letter to the American church. It's why I believe God called me to write the Bonhoeffer story to show that there are times in history when God allows the church to do what it wants. And we see the evil that comes as a result of it. It's a terrible thing that God does not 
you know, uh, force us to do the right thing. He gives us the freedom to choose. It's a scary thing. And so right now, the American church has that freedom to choose. We've effectively been choosing wrongly by saying, you know what, we don't want any trouble. We're just going to do church. Well, the German Christians just wanted to do church. Meanwhile, Jews are being demonized and then rounded up and then sent in boxcars uh, to the death camps. All of this was going on because the church in the beginning did not speak up and speak out. Well, that brings me to my next question. Where do you predict this could go for America if the church doesn't step up as you are calling it to do? I don't think uh, we can know. All I can tell people is that there is no doubt that evil is real. We've been shielded from it because we've been so blessed. We've been living in a free country uh, that has flourished. We haven't been forced to see satanic evil in the way that people in third world countries have had to see it, people uh, in the former Soviet Union, people in North Korea, people in China, try to be a Christian, an outspoken Christian in China today. Those people are no different than we are, but we kind of act like, well, yeah, they're different. They live in a, we, we don't, we are really uh, subject to the same laws that God um, has uh, given all around the world. And we've been particularly blessed. So we act as though, you know, that evil can't really rise here. But we see it happening all the time. Already we're seeing it. We're seeing the beginnings of it. Parents are being demonized. If they are against their child saying, I'm in the wrong body, they are being demonized by the government. They're being demonized. The FBI, various government forces are suddenly dividing children from their families. That's exactly what happened in the former Soviet Union in East Germany. It happened in China. This is what happens in godless cultures where the government becomes more powerful. Um, so we've only seen the beginnings of it, but can we imagine where it's going to go? Well, where it's going to go, we don't even want to imagine it. But if people need to imagine it to get scared into action, they should imagine it. All you need to do is think of what happened in Germany. Germany was an amazingly civilized, wonderful society, tremendously Christian in many ways, but they refused to take action at the time when it was absolutely vital to take action. And the results are like a waking nightmare. We want to pretend it didn't even happen. Um, it is vital that we understand it did happen. It's vital that we understand it will happen to us. It's happening to us if the church is silent. And so I wrote a letter to the American church to, to, to help people understand biblically what their role is and to understand that maybe they've been getting it wrong and they need to repent. Maybe their pastor's getting it wrong. Maybe they need to go to a different church because the time is now. If you went to a German in 1933 and showed him what the future held and said, if you keep going to the church you're going to, this is what's going to happen. You better find a church or find a pastor or find a, a home group that understands this is evil and that this is where it's going. If they could see then what happened, they would have been radically different, radically different. But they couldn't see it. They couldn't imagine it. They thought it would just go away by itself. And it did not. And because allowed, because God allowed that evil to rise, that should be an example to us, a cautionary tale, the ultimate cautionary tale to American Christians that this is happening to you now. Uh, open borders, transgender madness, uh, rampant crime, a two-tiered justice system, parents being divided from their kids, uh, insane uh, trans ideology being forced, uh, drag queen story hour. No matter where you look, you see this kind of madness. If the church doesn't stand against it, which by the way, it's my belief that God calls the church to stand against it. Um, but if the church does not, uh, if you as a Christian do not participate with those who are standing against it, the Lord will allow evil to continue to rise. And what we've seen is just the beginning. It will come for absolutely everyone. And that's the warning. You think it's just going to happen to other people. That's never the case. It happens to them first. If you do nothing, eventually it will find its way to you and to your family. And I think that uh, we're commanded to love our neighbors. If you love your neighbors, you won't let this stand. Well, Eric, that's a sobering message. Where can people uh, and when can people see this film? The film comes out February 8th on Epoch TV. Uh, it's really exciting to me that uh, Epoch TV, they're very brave, by the way, uh, Epoch Times, um, E-P-O-C-H um, TV.com. But uh, it's available. It's very inexpensive. I hope everyone will watch it uh, and will tell their friends to watch it, uh, tell their fellow church members to watch it. Uh, I, I, I simply know that unless the church is the church, unless we rise to do what God has called us to do in this hour, 
right. will be guilty of the same thing the German church was guilty of. Um, we're no different than the Germans. Um, if we flatter ourselves that we are, we're going to get it very wrong. We're getting it wrong. Many churches right now shy away from this. So it's vital to me. This is a, it's God's message. It's not my message. So the book is Letter to the American Church. The film, you can find details and how you can get involved at letter to the American church.com. I, I hope everyone listening will want to get involved, will want to do what they can. Go to the website, letter to the American church.com. Uh, churches can get free screenings if they go to letter to the American church.com and fill out the form. This is just, uh, I really believe it's God's message. It's certainly not my message. It's God's message to his church, uh, to those who are, who are willing to hear it, who are willing to put their faith into action. Eric, again, thank you so much for joining us. My privilege. God bless you.